starting, if I was choosing one of these today for me, the Honda for sure. Now I know that's kind of shocking because I'm I have this bike and I'm doing the build, but after kind of thinking about it, riding it, I think the Honda fits me a lot better. Hello everyone and welcome to Big Rock Moto. Thank you so much for tuning in today. In today's video, I'm gonna do a first ride on Honda's 2024 CRF 450 RL. Now, I totally understand that this bike, without the R in the name anyway, which is really the same bike, has been out since about 2019 meaning that for the past five years, I've never ridden Honda's high performance 450 dual sport bike, which is crazy. And it's a huge gap in my reviews that I've been meaning to address. So in this video, it's gonna be really simple. We're not gonna do all of the, the breakdown of all the specifications and all the nitty gritty details. I'm simply gonna jump on the bike, go for a ride on and off road and share with you my impressions as someone who is really used to riding KTMs, Husqvarna's, Betas, the more lightweight, um, arguably, <laughs> I say arguably, debatably, uh, high, higher performance dual sport bikes. So I think this video is gonna be really interesting, not just for myself, but I hope for you too, to give you a perspective on sort of how this feels in comparison to those European dual sport bikes. Now, in the next video on this bike, I will be doing my full in-depth comprehensive review. So we'll do comparisons, we'll do specifications, uh, we'll do ex extensive ride testing. I'll show you all the features of the bike. So we'll really go through everything. But in this video, we're just gonna do riding impressions. All right, a few things I did to make sure I get the absolute best, most honest first riding impression. Tire pressures, the manual said 22 PSI, but I know from experience that's really high for off-road, which we're gonna be most of the time. So I lowered that to around 15 front and back. Without having rim locks or heavy duty tubes, I don't really wanna go any lower than 15. I think that's a good compromise. The tires are the factory tires, which are an IRC tire. They're really more of a, well, they're very, very dual sporty tire. They're not really designed for aggressive off-roading. So we'll have to keep that in mind, but that's what you get on this bike. So the bike's totally stock, right? A few, a couple other things I did. I made sure like the handlebars and the levers were in appropriate position, you know, basic things like that. But the main things was I checked all the suspension clickers. So all the suspension clickers for compression and rebound are on the factory recommended settings. Now, if we want to adjust them, I have a multi-tool in my pocket. We can do that out on a trail, but I want to start from that baseline. The other most, the other important thing I did, you can see here, I've got my Motul Slacker. Um, I'm not sponsored by this company. I paid for this tool and I absolutely find this indispensable. This sticks on here like this, and then you zero it out and it connects to your, well, I'll show you. The thing about the sag is that when a motorcycle doesn't have the right geometry front to back, the balance is off and it throws the handling way off. So I looked up the sag um, recommended race sag settings, which is you sitting on the bike with all your gear. It says between 95 to 115, I think. So I wanna shoot kind of for in the middle of that. So maybe around 105, somewhere around that. I don't mind a tiny bit more sag just for a little bit more stability but you don't wanna be going outside that range. So when I first checked the bike, when I got it home from Honda, uh, this is a borrowed bike from Honda, by the way. When I first got it home, it read 127 millimeters of sag with me sitting on it without even my riding gear. So I was like, okay. So I grabbed my, this is my Tusk preload adjusting tool. You can use it to drive the preload, the nut on the uh, shock. And this is what's called a hammer. Um, Harbor Freight, I think, very, very fancy. Uh, and I started adjusting it. So. I'll show you how the mole tool works. And I've got it, I've got the sag dialed in now, but I wanna show you how this thing works. So I'll pull out my phone here. It connects Bluetooth to your phone and see, so you make sure you pull the bike all the way up, make sure it's zeroed out. So it is, okay. Now you sit on the bike and you can do this all by yourself. You don't need a helper, which is the cool thing. So I sit on the bike, take my weight off of it, balance it on my tiptoes and I've got about one yeah, I've got about 110, 110 millimeters of sag. And I've got all my gear on, camelback, helmet, everything. So that's that's good. We're in that factory range. 
so we should have good handling and we can always adjust later so highly recommend a slacker it's well worth the money um, even if you you know just own one or two bikes it's it's indispensable um, because when you change setups or weight or gear you need to reset your sag so i'll put this away okay let's begin our test uh just riding on the highway a little bit Okay, so there you could see the zero to zero to 65, zero or zero to about 100 kilometer an hour acceleration. That was full throttle. Um, you know, the power is is about what I expected. So I kind of expected it to be like a little bit more than a DRZ, but like not as much as like a KTM 500 or something. And uh, yeah, it it feels about right. It it feels like the amount of power is is very very moderate I would say for for it's not what you expect from a 450 and yes I I fully understand that there's ways uh, that are very popular ways to tune these bikes with ECUs and exhaust and all sorts of things to get much more power I fully understand that but my job right now is to test the bike as you bring it home from the factory or sorry from the dealer now the next thing I noticed about it, well, I wasn't even in top gear, <laughs> so I'm so used to riding other bikes that yeah, I didn't even know. I okay, so sixth gear is very comfortable at 62 miles an hour or 100 kilometers an hour, and one of the things I noticed for sure after getting off my Husqvarna is the lack, almost complete lack of vibration relative to the to the KTM or the Husky. So when you ride a KTM or Husky 500 or 501, there is a massive amount of vibration. And it's a real problem. Just my opinion, but I ride this bike, I don't, I don't feel that at all. I, I feel very, very smooth. It just has an overall sense of refinement. You know, it's quiet, it's smooth, it's pretty comfortable for such a high performance bike. The gearing feels pretty tall. I don't know how accurate the speedometer is, but 65 is 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 very comfortable and uh, very little vibration. Now the seat is not comfortable, and that's why almost everybody changes out the seat. The seat feels uncomfortable right away, so you just expect that. But I'm starting to already see why these are so popular because if you can have a high performance off road bike that can cruise at well, 65, 70 miles an hour. I start to feel buzz at 70 through the handlebars. If you start, if you have that ability to go comfortably down the highway at 65, 70, and then hit the trails aggressively, and have the reliability the Honda brings and the build quality, that's a that's a home run. And they have had a home run with this bike. It's been a huge success. Yeah, 70 miles an hour. You feel, you definitely start feeling the buzz coming through the handlebar. That's for sure. It gets up to 80 miles an hour, no problem. We are on a slight downhill though. Just quickly, I wanna share with you the gear I'm using on today's ride. Starting at the bottom, Alpenstar's Tech 7 Enduro Dry Star Boots. Uh, underneath all this, I have MSR base layers. Then I've got the Climb Baja S4 pant. I've got a Climb Zephyr wind shirt underneath the Climb Baja S4 for some wind protection on a cool morning. And then I take that off and I have full ventilation. Uh, then I'm using a Moscow Moto Wildcat uh, backpack. And then I'm using uh, a Cryos Pro from Climb, Cryos Pro helmet, um, and Revit Off-Track 2 gloves. And I think that about covers the riding gear. If you wanna check out any of the riding gear, I have links below. I do receive a small commission from those, which I reinvest back into content creation here on the channel. Thank you so much for checking that out. Okay, let's start the off-road test doing some two-track, fire road, Jeep trail-y stuff. This track goes up in these mountains here, and it's eh, pretty rugged, pretty rocky. It's not extreme, like I'm comfortable doing it on this bike with the stock tires by myself, but it's like it's not something you would really take a big adventure bike on. It's a bit too rough and sketchy for that. So let's see how we go.
okay, so, you know, initial impressions, first time ever riding this, uh, one of these off-road. <clears throat> uh, it's pretty impressive. It's definitely like that one level up from like a DRZ. Now, uh, there's a couple things I noticed. The motor has a lot of, a lot of good bottom and mid-range power. Um, it's actually just got good power all around. I don't know what these put out stock, like around 40 horsepower at the wheel, something like that. That's what it kind of feels like. You can lift the front end up really easily just by using the throttle. That part's good. The bad part is, and I know this is like not a revelation because everybody already knows this, but the, I, I immediately notice um, the surginess at low throttle openings. So at low throttle openings, you know, it's like it's like lurching and makes it difficult to ride at lower speeds. I think if you're if you're cruising a lot and not doing that as much at the low speeds, um, you can kind of ride around that problem. But man, it's already really noticeable. Suspension is definitely the the forks feel pretty decent to me. I might back off the compression here when we get to the top. Um, the back feels really spongy, uh, soft, but that, you know, I, I'm over the weight for probably the, the springs that come in the bike. So I'm 200 pounds, 90 kilos. So that, you know, these bikes are really set up for somebody around 170 pounds for like, you know, 75 kilo, kilos, somewhere in there. Anyway, let's do some more riding. And I'm not going to go too fast because I don't really want to get a flat tire out here by myself. And again, I don't have, you know, I just, it's stock equipment. So I just got to be kind of nice to it. One thing, one thing I like about how it's so soft, I'm gonna try riding, try riding at low speed through these rocks here. Man, that throttle is horrible. It's, it's so jerky. Um, but what I do like about the softer, the softer nature of this is that you can kind of sit down. I know you, you shouldn't sit down but the thing is, when you're on dual sport rides all day, you just need to save energy. So it's, it's real plush and, and it kind of like the DRZ in that way. It's something I can kind of be lazy all day and just kind of ride. I do, I do like that. But yeah, it's like that, that partial throttle opening at low speeds, man, it's just, I feel like I'm riding a bucking Bronco. Now another thing, do I notice the extra weight? It's about 40 pounds heavier uh, than my Husky 501. Um, yeah, I, I do notice it, to be honest, it, it does. It feels heavier going through the, the rough terrain and it, the steering's not as fast, but it's not all bad because it feels really stable and easy to ride. And it might be a better bike to do long rides on because it's just a little bit more comfortable. <laughs> really like the motor. I mean, the power is pretty good. Like it has pretty like punchy power. You can really, <laughs> you can really uh, wheelie very, very nicely. So what I'm going to do is take, I'm going to take about three clicks out of the front, so out of the compression on the front and maybe Maybe speed up the rebound just a little bit too. The back, eh, I'm not really gonna mess with the back. It just feels like it's undersprung, which it is. Uh, it's starting to get warm out here. This is kind of where the desert meets the mountains. So it's kind of that like transition zone where I'm riding. So I live in the mountains way up in there. And that's the Coachella Valley. So that's super hot, super low elevation. Very dynamic, interesting geography here, Southern California. It's getting warm out here. Um, Definitely getting warm. So I adjusted the, I took two clicks out of the compression. I also bled the air. There's little air bleeders here. So I figured with elevation and everything, uh, cause I picked the bike up at sea level and now I'm at 4,000, 5,000 feet. So bled the air from the forks to make sure that we get the best ride we can 
and uh, we'll try that. Um, but you know, it's good. You have the tunability and the suspension, but if you're going to keep this bike a long time and you're you really love it and you're ag an aggressive rider, have the suspension tuned by a shop. You know, you're going to get so much more out of it. Even just getting the right springs for your weight, it just feels like the front's kind of stiff and the rear's kind of soft. So that's kind of interesting. Just feels a bit out of balance, just to me. I don't know. It, honestly, I don't feel much of any improvement from that change, so I'm not sure. That would take a lot more time to really play with it and get the suspension dialed in. But it's for a stock dual sport suspension, it's it's very, very good. It's actually one of the best out there for a factory suspension. Um, so that's good. I mean, it, it's really, yeah, it, it's very good suspension for this price point that this bike comes in at. Very, very rocky through here. Oh, that was not what I wanted to do. You have a lot of travel with this suspension. Like it's, uh, it's really impressive. You you can ride the bike pretty fast. I don't know. I'm really liking this thing. I I love this bike actually. I think. I think I'd rather have this than my Husky, and I'll talk about talk about why later. But I think this would be a better bike for me. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's do some single track. You know, uh, nothing too extreme, but like I take the KLX back here, the 501. Um, Let's see, everybody says, you know, they're so hard to ride because of the, the flame outs or stalling and surging. I guess we're about to find out, see how bad it actually is, or isn't. Well, I didn't start well. I mean, it's it's doable. It just doesn't feel that that smooth, you know. Nope. Oh. Oh, where I'm. Oh. Can't really, you know, it's spring, it's springtime, and the uh, we need to come do some trail maintenance out here. Meaning, I need to come do trail maintenance because it's all of our responsibility. But yeah, you can see I've stalled it a couple times. Part of that could just be that my my riding skills for single track kind of suck, which is absolutely true. Very narrow. Still having fun though. Ooh, that little plastic skid plate is not giving me too much uh, confidence to really huck this thing through the boulders. Yeah, it, it just, you feel like, you hear it almost like the exhaust like pop and it, and it kind of feels like it wants to, to flame out. It's not always doing it, but it, it's hard to ride smooth, <laughs> for sure. So yeah, you're gonna have to address that. And you got, you know, if you already own this bike, you're already yelling at the computer, you know this. It's not anything really revolutionary that I'm saying. I could totally see that with a, a few changes, this is the absolute, you know, ultimate, like all around dual sport bike or super lightweight adventure bike. I totally get it, totally get it. I'm not lost, I, I'm not lost. Don't Don't even say that. You know what? You know what? I, I'm not. I'm perfectly good. Perfectly fine. Oh no! There we go. See, I told you I wasn't lost. I'm not lost. Not at all. 
my navigation is perfect. But you see the the stalling. It's like when I'm when I'm clutching at real low RP, at real low speed. It just it keeps stalling, stalling, stalling. Yay! That's narrow. Shoot. Ah, yeah, I, I totally get what everybody says now. Oh my god. So second gear it just it just dies. <laughs> it just completely completely just flames out. I do like single track riding. This is very fun. Much more uh, aerobic, much better workout than street riding, that's for sure. Ow! I hit the tree with my helmet. Okay, well, I totally get the whole fueling issue. It's too bad, you know, it's got to be, well, I know it's something with uh, emissions regulations or, you know, so, some sort of government agency that forces them to tune the bike this way. It's too bad they couldn't kind of get around that. But beyond that, I love the bike. <laughs> Absolutely love it. Uh, wow. Really, really like this bike. I know it sounds crazy to say after I had all those issues with the stalling, but I mean, you can fix that. And then once that's fixed, a few other changes, man, this thing would be dialed. Now, if you're shopping for a Honda CRR450RL, you're obviously cross-shopping its closest competitor, the Honda Monkey 125 ABS. So let's do an in-depth comparison. Ground clearance, you can see we have a little bit more on the 450. No, no, obviously that's probably not the competitor to the CRR450L, but I still think you should check out the Honda Monkey review, which is coming in the next few weeks here on the channel. This is a really hilariously fun, awesome little machine. All right, back from the ride and just thinking about more of the comparison, you know, we'll cover this more in the in-depth review on the Honda, but like I own this Husky, right? And I'm doing the build up on it, which is very expensive, very time consuming. Yeah, all that stuff, but it's also, you know, you can make the bike really amazing. Um, the Husky or the KTM, you're starting off about 35 or 40 pounds lighter. The power is actually, I would say about equivalent between the two in stock form. Um, and I kind of like the power delivery of the 450 more than the 501. What I actually like is the KTM or Husky 350. That's my favorite. The reasons why we'd have to get into another video because it's kind of a lengthy explanation. Uh, what else? The suspension, if you compare stock suspension on the Husky to stock on the Honda, these new generation, the 24 bikes, they're definitely better for sure. It's the best factory suspension on a dual sport, in my opinion, the, the new 2024 updated KTM and Huskies. Better than the Honda, although the Honda's still pretty good. And I think with tuning to the Honda, you could exceed the, the, the factory suspension on the Husky for sure. Um, so that, that's, that's, I would, the Honda suspension I'd be very happy with. It's actually smoother and more comfortable than riding the Husky or the KTM. And that counts for something when you're dual sporting and riding all day or doing light adventure riding. Um, maintenance is about the same between the two, and I can hear some people getting angry about that, but that, that's, that's really the truth. They have kind of similar maintenance intervals. Um, reliability is, I, I can't measure that. Uh, I mean, people are going to say the Honda is more reliable than a KTM or Husky. I don't really know. Maybe. Uh, that's what everybody tends to, tends to say or tends to think. Um, for really aggressive fast riding you know these lighter weight bikes come into their own for general dual sport riding or super light adventure riding i'll take the honda for sure it's just more comfortable the vibration okay vibration on this thing is absolutely horrible just horrendous i hate that part about this bike the honda it doesn't have that problem very smooth for a single cylinder no issues with vibration even with factory handlebars factory grips factory seat pegs no issue riding that bike with vibration at 65 on the highway this thing well your fillings and your teeth will fall out it's it's that bad so you have to do all this stuff to kind of address that um if i was starting if i was choosing one of these today for me the honda for sure now i know that's kind of shocking because i have this bike and i'm doing the build but 
after kind of thinking about it, riding it, I think the Honda fits me a lot better. And so what I'm thinking maybe, you know, once I wrap up this build and kind of get that done, um, maybe then I'll do a build on one of the Hondas, but not go too crazy with the, with all the fancy parts, but just the basic stuff. Um, I think it fits how I ride better because I'm not a hardcore enduro rider. I'm not racing. And I just, I like the smooth, smoothness, the refinement, just the, the kind of higher, I don't know how to say, I don't want to say quality, but just feels more well-made, I guess. A little bit more solid than the, than the lighter weight Huskies, KTMs, and Betas. So that's my take. I don't know. Let me know what you think down in the comments below. All right. Well, thank you for tuning in to today's episode. Keep in mind that the next episode on this bike is going to be my full comprehensive in-depth review. So please stay tuned for that. That'll be the longer video where we really go into all the details of this and we'll get more into some of the comparisons if you're trying to choose between this and other dual sport motorcycles. Um, everything from you know a KLX 300 to a DRZ 400 uh, to the KTM, Beta and Husqvarna European uh, competitors. So I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you got something out of it. I sure enjoyed making this video. Thank you so much for watching. Please ride safe and I'll see you out there.